Patrick, I've been obsessed with consciousness for most of my uh, adult life, and free will is this marvelous probe to discern what consciousness can be all about. I've talked to philosophers, and the arguments are absolutely fascinating. But after you get weighed down with compatibilists and incompatibilists and what is free will and how do you do it, at the end of the day, I really want to get some hard data. What's going on in the brain? That's why I'm coming to you. So is free will an illusion? What does the brain tell us? Okay, I think in part, free will has to be an illusion because modern brain science has great difficulty in dealing with the way that we think about free will in our, every, in our everyday lives. And the way we think about free will in, in our everyday lives is effectively inherited from Aristotle and then from Descartes, so we can call it Cartesian free will. So the concept of Cartesian free will is that my conscious thoughts and my conscious intentions, which are somehow part of my mental life mm. and independent of the material substance of my brain and my body can nevertheless cause my brain and my body to do things. So let's take a simple scenario. I think I want to lift my arm. That's mm -hmm. a conscious event. And according to the Cartesian view, that thinking, that conscious process, leads to my arm going up. That's a common folk way of thinking about it, too. Most people have that feeling. I mean, I have that feeling. I think we all have that feeling in our everyday lives. Right. So the, the philosopher David Hume said that he needed to leave his philosophy when he left his armchair. And I think on the point of free will, right. probably we're all in that situation right. because we all will say things like, hmm, I wonder what restaurant I want to go to tonight. Do I want to go to the Chinese or to the Italian? Right. And that seems very Cartesian. But right. now let's look at what, yeah. what happens in the brain. So the, the assertion of the Cartesian view of free will is that there's some causal path from consciousness, from mental events, which are somehow separate from the body and from the brain and from material substance but they can somehow make the brain and the body do things. Yeah. And that's the point where neuroscience just says no. What is this uh, mind-to-brain causation? It seems really incoherent. Nobody can give a good description of it. It seems almost mystical. So from a neuroscientific point of view, there is no conscious mind independent of the brain. The conscious mind is a product of the brain, not something different from it. And I think this was really shown very clearly in the famous Libet experiment. So the experiment's deceptively simple, but it tells us a lot. So let me just briefly summarize the Libet experiment. So in the Libet experiment, the participant is given this rather strange instruction to, to make an action whenever you feel like mm -hmm. it. So the action that Libet originally studied was a simple brisk movement of the arm, of the, of the wrist. Now, while this is happening, the participant is watching a clock hand rotating on an oscilloscope screen, because Libet did his experiments back before the days of computers, in fact. And the participant's task is to report the moment when they feel the conscious intention or the will or the urge, as Libet put it, to make the action which they then subsequently make. So using this method, uh, Libet was able to time the conscious experience of will, of free will. And while he was doing that, he was also recording the brain activity of the participants using electrodes placed on the scalp. And in particular, he was interested in these areas in the frontal part of the brain, which we know are concerned with the planning and initiation of action. And the really interesting part of the Libet experiment is that you can record a so-called readiness potential, a buildup of brain activity over the planning centers of the yeah. brain. Often a second or so before the person makes this movement that they decide to make. A second is a long time in brain time. In brain time, it's <laughs> extremely long, right? <laughs> the brain can do a lot in a second. But the conscious experience that the person reports using the rotating mm. clock, the conscious experience that I'm about to move my hand now, or I feel like moving my hand now, or now I experience the the will, the intention, the urge to move my hand, that happens on average only a couple of hundred milliseconds before the hand actually moves. It's a fifth of a second. A fifth of a second. As opposed to a full second where you have the brain activity. Correct. So there's a really big gap, mm. which is about 800 milliseconds or more, mm. 
between the brain beginning to prepare the action and you having the conscious experience that you're going to act. Now, if you think about it, that's exactly the opposite temporal order mm. from what the Cartesian account of free will would require. Right. So the, the way that we think about free will in our everyday lives, and which Descartes summarized for us, is that our conscious thoughts cause our actions. Descartes didn't talk a lot about brain activity, but now a neo-Cartesian would say conscious thought causes brain activity, which causes movements of the body. But in fact, what Libet did is he showed that the, the causal sequence is really exactly the opposite, that first you have brain activity, and then you have the conscious experience that you're about to move. Mm. Now, that seems quite dramatic. I'm actually not surprised. I'm a neuroscientist, so I think that our conscious experience and our mental life is a product of our brain. I don't think it comes from anywhere else. I don't think my conscious thought comes from, from my toes or from my skin or from, from uh, a box in my sitting room. No, I think it's a product of my brain. So I think from a scientific point of view, when you think hard about the Libet experiment, it's actually got to be that way around. Mm. But, of course, the experiment raises some very interesting issues because the way that we live our everyday lives and, in fact, the way that our societies are set up, for example, <laughs> our legal systems are set up, really does look quite Cartesian because it looks as though it's assuming that our conscious thought is the cause of our action. So that leads to a, a, a really interesting uh, tension between what neuroscience tells us about how our brains work and how our brains generate our actions mm. and how we think as individuals, as people with our own opinions, mm. and as a society about how people make mm. actions. Mm. And that, I think, is why free will is a really interesting topic. Now, what research have you done that extends the Libet experiment to see really what may be going on there? All right. Well, let me tell you about one experiment that we did and we published back in 1999, uh, which I think was quite interesting from the point of view of conscious free will. In reaction to the Libet experiment, many people said, oh, the experience of intending an action, the conscious experience that I'm going to lift my arm now, is just an illusion. It's just a confabulation. There's one rather interesting story which suggests that maybe the reason why we have the experience of conscious free will is that we, we find our arm is up in the air. I have to give a, uh, explain it. <laughs> and we've got to explain it. It might be a bit scary. So you say, oh, Patrick, don't worry. It's OK. You plan to do that. Yeah. Uh, that's your action. You don't yeah. need to be worried that somebody's controlling your, mm -hmm. your body or aliens are moving your arms about. So from that point of view, conscious free will might just be a retrospective story that we use to explain what we find ourselves doing. Well, how then would we get the, uh, the uh, what do you think is an illusion of the temporal order that consciousness comes first? Uh, is that read back into the system? So that's the theory. So the, the brain is rather good at fudging the timeline yeah, of consciousness. Right, right. So we think of consciousness <coughs> as being a, a, a line. Right. People talk about the stream of consciousness, mm. and streams seem to only flow in one direction. But from the brain's point of view, it can reverse engineer the stream rather well. So there are lots of illusions in, in psychology. They've been very much studied in vision and in hearing, where you can uh, experience things that happening at a time quite different from when they actually happen. And you can experience uh, a to happen before B, when in fact B happens before A. So it wouldn't mm. be beyond the capabilities of the brain to stitch time up wow. and to reorganize things yeah. so that you felt that you had the intention to lift your arm before your arm actually went up, even though... Are the, there are experiments that show that? Um, I think there are experiments that show it, and there are, it's mostly the evidence of this kind of rearrangement of temporal order comes mostly from sensory work. It comes mostly from work on vision <laughs> and audition. And one of the interesting questions is, does it also happen for our experience of our own actions? Right, right. So let me tell you about the experiment that we did, which, which is interesting because it suggests that, in fact, part of the experience of what we do really is generated at the time that we prepare to do it. And it's not just all a retrospective confabulation. Okay. So we have a Cartesian idea that our conscious thoughts, which are somehow independent of our brain and our material body, are causing our actions. 
But really, this is not neuroscientifically possible. So no neuroscientists are really surprised by the result of the Livet experiment because consciousness has got to be a product of our brain activity. Mm -hmm. So it's the activity of neurons in our brain which give us our conscious experience. It's not in my toes. It's not in somebody else's brain. It's not coming from anywhere else apart from the brain. But that then poses an interesting problem and puts a quite interesting tension between neuroscience on the one hand and the way our societies work because our societies and our legal systems and our cultures are based on the idea that our conscious thinking and our conscious uh, experience is the cause of our actions and that's what makes us responsible for our actions. So I think we're coming to a point where our neuroscientific knowledge about how we work as brain machines mm -hmm. and our societal uh, structures are going to have to have some interesting dialogues.